Okay, so we'll start off with the, the space news for July 9th, representing the last month. Uh, jumping right in to uh, kind of almost local news here. The FAA has allowed Starship launches, but with a lot of provisos. They're calling them minor steps. So this is launches out of Boca Chico, down there by Brownsville, what they call Starbase. They've okayed it essentially, except for 75 environmental mitigation kind of steps. And a lot of them are sort of reasonable. One of them though kind of jumps out that initially they're only going to allow five launches per year. Now right there, that of course would rule out the general SpaceX plans because they want to be you know, launching a lot more often than that, but that it was initial. But there are other things like limits on the road closures. People had complained that they were not able to get to the beach and that sort of thing. They weren't providing adequate notices on when launches were coming, so they had to notify people more. Setting up environmental monitoring will be necessary and removing debris when there are explosions, uh, getting it out of sensitive areas. Now, there are also some what I would call just plain old silliness um, associated with some of this. First one, yeah, they have to prepare a historical context report explaining what happened in that area during the Mexican-American War and the Civil War. So, you know, go figure. They have to make annual contributions for some fishing programs, adopt an oscillate, a few other things like that, restore some historical markers. There's some other things, but basically those are all things they can do relatively easily. But in the meantime, Musk has said that Boca Chica will mainly be an R&D center. So they'll be developing new rockets there. That's more consistent with the more occasional launches as opposed to the routine launches they hope to get, which will be out of uh, Kennedy Space Center. Okay, the next uh, item up here is the at the International Space Station, there's various cargo resupply ships up there. There's Russian ones and American ones. One of them is called Cygnus, made by Northrop Grumman. It recently just lifted the ISS, International Space Station, orbit up a half a mile at perigee, which is the lowest orbital point, at a tenth of a mile. There were two different tries. The first one, yeah, it lasted maybe five seconds or something, and they gave it up. And then it came back like a week or two later. That is actually pretty important because it shows that the space station can survive even if the Russians stop cooperating on the space station. Typically, their corrections are bigger. They boost maybe a mile, but at least we're proving that uh, it can be done here. So we've reduced the risk that if the Russians do pull out of the space station anytime in the future, we can keep going for a while. The Russians provided a boost in two different ways. One was using thrusters that are attached to the space station, and the other, the main one, is actually through their cargo craft, the progress uh, ships that they use. There's still somewhat of a problem, though, and that's that how do you get Cygnus up to the space station? That's the craft you see in, in the picture here. Right now, they take them up on Antares rockets made by Northrop Grumman. But the problem with those is they use Russian engines, and so those are no longer going to be used. We only have two of those left. So there's two more missions. That'll carry us through for you know a year or two. Atlas rockets can also take these up, but they're all spoken for as well. They have Russian engines, and in any case, they're all spoken for, and they're going to be used up. But in the future, there is the Vulcan rocket coming along. The other thing is Boeing Starliner could also do this job. And it's not up there yet, but you know it will be eventually. So the longer-term hope is things will work out. Next item up, in theory here, the first product manufactured in space has actually been sold. And this is by a company called Redwire. It's really their subsidiary, which is called Made in Space, which people may have heard of before. They manufacture some optical crystals. They grow them, essentially growing a single crystal. They sold it for about $4,000. Since it was only two grams, that translates to about $2 million per kilogram. The crystal is made of what KDP, potassium dihydrogen phosphate. It's used in high energy lasers. Typically, they have defects in them. Those defects limit how much power you can put through the, the lasers, and they end up breaking one way or another. So they grow one large crystal, and this was made on their crystallization facility on the space station. As I said, the crystals that are made on Earth typically have defects that show up in gravity. So they made this. Now, the thing is, they sold it to Ohio State University. It was called the Center for Electron Microscopy. This is probably a little bit of a gimmick in the sense that, really, Redware wants to know how good is that crystal? They want the people with electron microscopes to look at it carefully. But still, I think the basic point is that we may be getting closer to having things we can actually manufacture in space. Okay, next thing is a general update on the Artemis and overall Moon to Mars programs. And there's really three topics here. The first is about Capstone, which is the first launch of the Artemis lunar program, really. Uh, the second one is a story about uh, some delays in Artemis that were leaked to the press. And then actually, I'll give us a, kind of a separate talk after the news. There's a, a Moon to Mars Objectives Workshop that NASA held, which some of us here attended, and we'll talk about that. So the first story, Capstone. This mission was launched from New Zealand on an electron rocket. The Capstone is a long acronym. I'm not going to even bother repeating it here. The key thing is it was the first launch of the Artemis Lunar Program. 
Its size is about the size of a microwave oven. In CubeSat units, which are four inch cubes, that's about 12 of those. There's a picture of it there. The main reason for doing this is to fly in the orbit of an upcoming part of the Artemis lunar program called Gateway, which will be an orbiter around the moon. And it's in a rather unusual orbit. So they really want to test it. In particular, lunar orbits are a little bit more complicated even than Earth orbits. The problem is you have concentrations of masses on the surface of the moon, meaning you don't really follow ideal orbit. Maybe you had a meteorite with heavy metals crash into the moon. It's heavier or lighter in those areas. It's more of a problem on the moon, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is simply that there's less mass of the moon. And the second part may be because we have plate tectonics on Earth, which tends to kind of even things out. So if something crashed a billion years ago, the effects of that have been spread around the planet. So it's not as much of a problem for Earth orbits. It's more of a problem for the moon orbits. But this is a kind of a special orbit for a couple of reasons. One is that it's far enough outside the moon that it is always can be in communication with Earth. The second thing is that, according to NASA, it's fairly easy to get in and out of the orbits. So it's a good place for sending things up and then back down to the lunar surface. That orbit it takes about six and a half days. And it goes out from 1,000 miles from the lunar north pole out to 43,000 miles from the lunar south pole. So it's very, very eccentric orbit. That's where that name near rectilinear, that, that part of that halo orbit comes in there. The halo orbit comes from, if you look at it from Earth, and if you could imagine seeing it, its entire orbit with a light or something, it looks like there's a halo around the moon. The rectilinear is because it's extremely eccentric, meaning the almost straight line when you're shooting out around the moon, it goes out very far. Now, the thing is, this is being done with a very small rocket. It's launched on an electron rocket, which is way, way smaller than, say, a Falcon 9 or something. So it's going to take a long time to get there. It takes about four months to get there. It's a very slow and cheap way to do it. And that's one of those trade-offs you'd make in space. That a lot of times, if you're just shipping something that's just cargo as opposed to people, you can take your time. Doug is asking, what is the propulsion system? Conventional, as far as I know. There are several parts to it, because there's the photon space tug. And that had, I forget what they used, but it was pretty much conventional stuff. And I think even the thrusters on the final satellite, as you're seeing here, are probably hydrazine. So I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think these are ion thrusters, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. No, it's really just because apparently it's a very low energy way to get there. They're actually relying on some pull from the sun a couple of times. It's, it's an interesting orbit. Part of that is to prove that you can do such a thing. Now, when they put the gateway up, they'll go there more directly. They won't take that long to get there when they have people. But on the other hand, for getting up cargo, you know, this may be more a way to do it. So they're kind of proving out several variations on getting to these kinds of orbits. A, a secondary goal of this mission is also to establish a navigation system. There is currently a NASA Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter up there already. It was launched in 2009. That does serve as a communications relay satellite, but they're trying to see if they can also estimate positions using just the combination of two satellites. It's not as good as GPS, but they're, they're trying to experiment with that anyway. A minor note, so the thing is launched on an electron rocket, but then there's a separate thing that is also made by rocket labs called the Photon Space Tug, which is a part of this and is what's carrying it most of the way to the moon, that with modifications will be the same craft they're going to be sending to Venus. Rocket Labs does have a mission plan to go to Venus. Pretty much it was a private mission. It's not even a government-sponsored mission. And they're saying they could get to Mars or even asteroids you know, using this, even though it's a very small rocket. The satellites are small, and by using clever orbits like this, you can get pretty far. Okay, now the bad news. And this was leaked that the, the Moon to Mars program overall is, is kind of in trouble. And this comes from Eric Berger, who is a reporter. He writes a lot on Ars Technica, and he's pretty widely regarded as having good inside information. So it's, it's taken pretty seriously that some NASA plans were leaked. The key thing is that their baseline plan is just not achievable, neither on time or on budget. They're just not going to make it. He says that NASA is looking at several alternatives, trading off budgets versus what you do. Um, in particular, things like the human landing, which would be on Artemis 3, that's probably going to slip beyond 2025. Originally, it had been scheduled for 2024 and then slid back to 2025. He's saying that probably won't make it. And every mission after that will be slower as well. There's probably about a dozen, and they're spreading out over time. The earliest lunar surface habitat, according to Eric, is about maybe 2034. So it's, it's really sliding out there. Mars, 2040s or 2050s even. So what he's saying is that mostly NASA is still focusing on building their lunar space station, the Gateway, instead of building up capabilities to get a sustainable presence on the moon's surface. And actually, it's the National Space Society goal that we think we want to have sustainable presence on the moon. And it doesn't look like they're going to be doing that anytime soon. There were some changes suggested to NASA in an objectives workshop that we attended, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, just some miscellaneous news. Bill Nelson may be playing the China card, meaning, well, how are we going to get funding for NASA? Well, one way is to play up the space race with China. It's real. 
but not everybody really realizes that or cares. But he's actually saying it now, and he's saying it kind of loudly. It was really just in an interview with a German newspaper, but it, it made the press back here after translation. He's explicitly saying there is a space race with China. We have to be concerned that they're going to try to land on the moon and say it's ours and you stay out. And that may sound extreme, but actually China has said in the past they pretty much view the moon and all the space in between as pretty comparable to the South China Sea. And if you've been following what goes on there, they're basically militarizing their islands. They're trying to say that you need permission to go there. So far, the United States has just kind of ignored that, but it's getting harder and harder for everyone to ignore those claims. China, of course, was very unhappy with all this. They did complain that the U.S. had defined space as a warfighting domain. Well, actually, that's true. We did actually say that. So who knows how this will turn out? But the question is, will space programs get more of a boost by more direct concerns about competing with China? And then there's a local interest story that will appeal to especially people that live down in Clear Lake area. Axiom Space, who makes space stations, they have leased the former Fry's Electronics store. Those stores went bankrupt. That store down there in Webster, Texas, had a full-scale mock-up of the International Space Station. A lot of it was just dangling from the ceiling. It was actually full-scale. You can see some in the lower right-hand side of this picture here. But there's a lot more to it than that, complete with the solar cells. They had the Canadian robot arm, all this stuff. It was all there. So it's kind of interesting that there's probably almost no other company in the world that would have a special interest in that, with the exception of Axiom, because they're going to be building space stations. They expect to put about 400 people there. That surprised me a little bit when I found out about this, because they are in the process of building a headquarters building down at Ellington Airport. It used to be Ellington Field, now it's Ellington Airport, also renamed as the Houston Spaceport. Anyway, they're apparently doing a lot for the sake of nostalgia, I guess. They're keeping all of this stuff around. Next up, how many launches have we had since the last meeting, which is around June 11th? We usually let people take a guess at this point. Name anybody. Would anybody like to take a guess? Okay, 10, and you said 30. Okay, any others? Okay, yeah, we had a variety here. Some people said 11 online. Some said 7. Okay, the actual answer, you'll have to wait to page 2 to find out the actual answer. Um, I don't think I'll go through all these, but I'll point out a couple of them. Um, Astra makes very small rockets. They're favored by the military because the military has been looking for things that are fast, flexible. They can, they can launch at a moment's notice from anywhere. And that's kind of what Astra does. But unfortunately, they've had mostly failures. And this is another one. They were trying to launch some research satellites for NASA and those failed. And of course, there were some Falcon 9 launches of Starlink satellites for their, their internet service. Um, I won't go into everything. Oh, there's a Korean rocket that went up, taking up some small satellites and, and a big load that was just basically ballast. The question was, yes, is South Korea. This is their government project. They are making progress. A variety of others, nothing really worth noting. We talked about Capstone already. India did another launch. But okay, here's the answer. There were 15. I will point out one other unusual one, which is Virgin Orbit. Everybody thinks about Virgin Galactic and you know, Richard Branson and all that. But Virgin Orbit is also one of his companies, but it's US-based and they launch satellites. They do the same basic strategy. They go up in a plane, you know, big mothership, and then they launch the rockets from there. And again, this is another one that the military tends to like it. This particular set of tests was for both the military and for NASA. They are making it work. They have done several successful launches now. Doug was asking airplanes. Virgin Orbit, I think, just uses this modified 747 we had a question back on the Astro launch. Yeah. So Doug's asking about the last one. I don't, I don't know if the last one blew up. There was one that I think was theirs, was the one that went up and one of the engines failed that just kind of drifted sideways for a while. And then, you know, finally, when they used up enough fuel, then they managed to go up. But it wasn't, you know, at that point, they couldn't make orbit. So they had, then they blew it up on purpose at that point. Yeah, I mean, they're an interesting company. They are those, they, they make the smallest rockets of all the commercial launch companies um, for orbital launches. The idea is that they can actually fit their rockets in a standard truck trailer. They can take it anywhere. So they go up, they often launch from Kodiak, Alaska. Um, they just drive up there and you know unload everything. And that's part of their appeal, you know, especially for the military, because the military tends to want to have things where, you know, suppose a satellite was shot down in a hurry, they could put up something else. And that's that's the kind of thing they look for. Different kind of goals than NASA. So any other questions or comments on news? things that we missed here. Okay, so uh, Doug is asking on the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, we're all waiting. I think it's July 12th or so, 11th or 12th is when they're supposed to start showing pictures. They apparently had some teasers. You know, they've said a few places they're going to be showing pictures. So there's been speculation and that sort of thing. But uh, I think we just have to wait to see the real thing. 
Now they had released some of their calibration kind of pictures when they were calibrating, but you know, everybody wants to see things far away in the universe. And so I'm, I'm sure they'll have good ones. They've been saving them up. Okay. <laughs>